we're moving on to the respiratory system. Um, and respiratory system, of course, is the way that your body um, gets oxygen and gets rid of carbon dioxide. Let me remind you of the mouse lab that you did. Um, when you did the mouse lab, that mouse lab was studying aerobic cellular respiration. Uh, that word respiration, that gets used in two entirely different contexts when we're talking about human physiology. We use the word respiration to mean breathing, like just inhaling, exhaling. We call that respiration. But you were studying aerobic cellular respiration. And in that context, the word is used to describe the way uh, the mitochondria of our cells are using oxygen with glucose in a biochemical way to create that molecule ATP and as a waste product, carbon dioxide and, and water, right? So why are we breathing? We're breathing because the human body is so big, we are so big, that even though there's oxygen all around us, that oxygen cannot diffuse into our cells and it cannot get to our mitochondria. So we need a way of actually delivering oxygen to our cells. Uh, well, we've got a transportation system, that's the cardiovascular system, but that transportation system still needs a way to actually get the molecules of oxygen. Our skin is designed to be pretty much airtight so that we don't lose all the water that's inside of us. So the respiratory system actually delivers the oxygen to our blood, right? And simultaneously, every time we exhale, we get rid of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, CO2, this is the primary waste product that our mitochondria are constantly making and we need to get rid of it. So we inhale oxygen, oxygen goes to all of our cells, helps us make ATP, the electricity, the energy molecule that makes our cells able to do stuff. And then we exhale the CO2, that's the waste product from using up the glucose and the oxygen. So constantly in and out, out with the old air, in with the new, we're going to be talking about that. Now, as we begin, and we're gonna come back to this, it's important for us to recognize that the air around us is not oxygen. It has got oxygen in it, but it actually is mostly nitrogen. So that question on the study guide, what is most of the air around you? Most of the air around you is a gas called nitrogen. The air around us is about 80% nitrogen, 79% nitrogen. It's only about 21% oxygen. And that is actually a good thing. Why is that a good thing? Because believe it or not, oxygen is a toxic gas. Someday when people from the planet Zorg come to find intelligent life on planet Earth, hopefully we're still here, but they are going to be astonished that there are these beings called humans that live in this toxic gas of oxygen, right? Oxygen is poisonous. Um, and so why is it good that this is not 100% oxygen? Even us humans, if we were forced to live in a room that was 100% oxygen, we would not live for that long. After a few days, you would start to get headaches, you would start to go blind, you would end up getting seizures and dying. You cannot live in 100% oxygen. Um, it's, it's toxic even for us. Um, I, I know it seems like we're asking people to breathe 100% oxygen, um, but uh, we will talk about why that is useful um, when we when we get there. Um, however, sometimes they'll put like a scuba diver that has had the bends and they'll put him in a 100% oxygen uh, pressure chamber and they can't, they can't stay there forever. It will, it will actually um, cause them to have seizures and go blind. So even when scuba divers get the bends, you can't put them in 100% oxygen. On top of that, oxygen is flammable. If you were in a 100% oxygen environment, 
like if this room was filled with 100% oxygen. And if I accidentally got a little bit of static electricity, a little spark, it would cause things to burst in flames. So we're only about 21% oxygen and that is good. There is almost no carbon dioxide in the air around us, which makes it very easy for us to get rid of carbon dioxide when we exhale. At sea level, there are a lot of oxygen molecules for every um, breath of air that you inhale. Up at high altitude, like Denver, Colorado, there is less, there are fewer molecules of oxygen for every uh, breath of air you take in. And that is why down here at sea level, we don't have very many red blood cells per drop of blood compared to at Denver, Colorado. It's also w w one of the reasons why Olympic training camps often are held at high altitude because there the air is thinner. So Olympic athletes that train there, they will get more red blood cells per drop of blood and that will help them in their competitions when they come back down to sea level. Now in 150, you learned the organs of the respiratory system. So make sure you have reviewed those. Um, there's probably going to be a question or two on the final exam, just asking if you know the path uh, that air takes in and out of the lungs. So as a quick recap, we are meant to breathe through our nose. The mouth is not a part of the respiratory system. We are meant to inhale through our nose and our nose is going to do wonderful things to the air that we're inhaling. And from the nose, it'll go down the three parts of the pharynx and then whoop, into our larynx, then down the trachea. Right here at the end of the trachea, a little triangular piece of cartilage called the carina. The carina is a very important landmark when we are performing clinical procedures on patients. So it's important to know this anatomical location, the carina. After that, primary bronchi, then secondary bronchi, then tertiary bronchi. Ultimately, we're going to get to the bronchioles. You should know from 150 that the bronchioles do not have cartilage in them. That's something very important. And finally, down here into the alveoli. The alveoli end up getting called air sacs, um, but they are microscopically small. They are not anything that you can see with the naked eye as you're looking at the lungs. And then air is going to come back out the way it went in. So airflow starts at the nose, then the pharynx, oh, larynx, goodness sakes, I don't have the larynx here. Let's put it in here. L-A-R-Y-N-X, then the larynx, then the trachea, then the bronchi. Right. Now, the lungs, they start at the bronchi. And uh, the primary bronchi uh, are, are still in your mediastinum uh, and go into your lungs. So the lungs start with the primary bronchi. Uh, and, and then in the lungs, it goes bronchi, primary, secondary, tertiary, respiratory, then the bronchioles, then the alveoli. Our, uh, from a medical point of view, the entire respiratory tract gets divided up into upper respiratory and lower respiratory. Upper respiratory infections, viruses that attack the upper respiratory system, they can make you very uncomfortable. They cause the symptoms of a head cold. They can give you a wicked bad sore throat. Um, but upper respiratory infections are very unlikely to be life-threatening. The lower respiratory tract, these are all the cells that, that there are all the parts of the lungs, um, including the trachea, and the cells that line those uh, airways, if they are attacked by a virus, um, then you could have a life-threatening infection. The influenza virus is not just a bad cold, right? Head colds are viruses that basically attack the upper respiratory tract. 
and they leave your lungs alone. And that's why they're unlikely to cause pneumonias. Influenza is a virus that can attack the upper respiratory as well as the lower respiratory tract. And um, that is one of the reasons why influenza is more a more severe illness and uh, is it is responsible even in a good year for causing 20,000 deaths in the United States. In a bad year, we can have 50 or 60,000 deaths from influenza in a year. So get your flu shots. And, uh, and here's another important thing. Uh, nurses that don't get their flu shots, they can still catch the flu. And about a third of the nurses that have caught the flu from their patients, they don't know they're sick but they are passing influenza off to all of the patients that they are treating. So it's really important, particularly for caregivers, to get their flu shots. Yes, we're not necessarily worried about you dying. We're worried about you giving it to the motorcycle accident patient that just came in, and then they end up dying in the hospital. So get your flu shots. All right. The trachea. The trachea um, is what we often call the windpipe, right? And it's not as long as I usually imagine it. It's only about four and a half, five inches long. It sits in front of the esophagus, right? The esophagus is right behind it. And I think that's just being polite because, um, because your trachea is here, we don't have to watch every big uh, gulp of food going down your esophagus because the esophagus is hiding behind the trachea. The trachea is propped open by rings of cartilage. Those rings of cartilage are shaped like the letter C, and the open area of the ring of cartilage faces backwards. And by the way, this arrangement of the esophagus to the trachea, and the fact that the trachea is open in the back, explains why things that get stuck in the esophagus can make us cough. So here's gonna be your esophagus sitting right there, right? And so if you have got something like, I don't know, a bite of really dry turkey um, stuck in your throat, then it can form like a little ball or a little wad here in the esophagus. And that is going to push against this soft area on the back of your trachea, and that can trigger coughing. It's important uh, from a medical point of view to know that it's not just things that are in your trachea and larynx that can cause you to cough, but something that is stuck in the esophagus can also cause you to cough. Let's see if we can go to back to that image here, right? So your esophagus is going right down here, right? And it's supposed to be dropping stuff off in the stomach. There are times when a patient's esophagus isn't working right. And if a patient's esophagus isn't working right, then food will build up, build up, build up, build up in the esophagus, and then it will start to cause coughing. It's not in the trachea. That's not why it's causing coughing. It's causing coughing because of what we were talking about here. So people that cough, and after they cough a little bit, suddenly seem to throw up, it can be that their esophagus isn't working right. And the reason that works is because of the arrangement of these uh, C-shaped rings. Oh, thought I was going to be erasing that. All right, we will start here at the beginning of the next video.